Welcome to Science360 Flower Power. I'm David, and this is a production of Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. Flowers come in all shapes and sizes. But why do plants have flowers? And what can we learn by studying flowers at a genetic level? We'll explore these questions during the remainder of this program. Uses for flowering plants pop up all the time in our day-to-day -day lives. All of the fruits and most of the vegetables that we eat come from flowering plants. And many building materials come from flowering plants as well. Fibers for textiles and chemicals for new medicines can also be found in some flowering plants. But all this brings us back to the question, why do some plants have flowers? Flowers help plants reproduce. Let's see how. Have you ever noticed how kids tend to look a little like their parents? We often share traits like hair color, eye color, and height with our parents. Traits like these are carried in genes, and genes are located on our chromosomes. So why do we share so many traits with our parents? The reason is that when humans reproduce, the child gets half of his or her chromosomes from the mother, and the other half from the father. Therefore, your genes are just a combination of genes from your mother and father. Plants reproduce this way too. The male and female parents each contribute half a set of chromosomes to the seedling. This process of combining the parental chromosomes to produce a seedling is called fertilization. But plants have a special challenge during reproduction. They can't move. So how can something that's stuck in the ground move its chromosomes from one place to another. That's where flowers come in. Flowers help plants reproduce through a process called pollination. Pollination just means that pollen, which contains two sperm cells, is moved to a place where it can send those sperm cells to the eggs located in the ovules. Let's take a look at the parts of the flower so that we can get a better idea of how that happens. These are the petals. The petals are often brightly colored, and we'll see why later. These are the sepals. The sepals used to be the outer covering of the bud before the flower opened. On lilies like this one, the sepals are identical to the petals. Here are the stamens. The tips of the stamens, called anthers, produce pollen. To the naked eye, pollen looks like a fine yellow dust. You could think of the stamens and the anthers as the male parts of the flower. Here is the pistil. This is the female part of the flower. You can see the stigma at the tip of the pistil. This sticky part is where the pollen must land during pollination. At the base of the pistil is the ovary. This is where the ovules are located. The eggs found in the ovules hold the female chromosomes. When the flower is pollinated, the pollen will deliver a set of male chromosomes to the egg. Not all flowers have all of these parts. And some flowers have some of these parts, but not others. Further, some plants like corn have separate male and female flowers on the same plant, while other species have separate male and female plants. Ginkgo is an example of this. You might think that pollen just has to move from the anther to the pistil within one flower to pollinate it. But while some flowering plants work this way, most attract animals like insects, birds, or bats to transport their pollen from one flower to another. These types of animals are called pollinators. Pollinators carry pollen from the anthers of one flower to the stigma of another flower. So what happens next? Once the pollen grain lands on the stigma, it forms a tunnel, called a pollen tube, which connects to the ovule. Then the pollen fertilizes the egg by adding its chromosomes to those in the egg. The egg develops into an embryo, the ovule develops into a seed, and the ovary develops into a fruit. The fruit eventually drops off of the plant, and the seeds may be carried away by wind, water, or some small animal. Finally, the seed may find its way into fertile soil, where it can germinate and grow into a new plant. In order for a flower to do its job of producing pollen, moving it from the stamens to the pistil so that the plant can reproduce, 
a lot has to happen. First, the flower has to open at the right time. The pistil and stamens have to both be functional, and all of the flower's parts have to develop in the right sequence. If anything goes wrong, or anything happens at the wrong time, the flower may not be able to be pollinated. Biologists at UNC want to learn how signals from the environment interact with directions from the flower's genes to guide their development. For example, doctors Jason Reed, Punita Nagpal, and some of their colleagues at UNC study the genes of a plant called Arabidopsis thaliana. Arabidopsis is commonly used for experiments because it has a short life cycle and a small genome which has been completely sequenced. Here is a normal chromosome from Arabidopsis. The stripe that you see is a gene. Remember that genes carry the plant's traits. Below this normal chromosome, you can see the development of a flower from a normal Arabidopsis. Botanists can study a particular gene by turning it off. By watching these mutant plants grow, we can learn if and how a particular gene affects flower development. For example, this new set of flowers comes from an Arabidopsis mutant with two genes turned off. The mutant plants may show a variety of unusual traits. Some of them have underdeveloped stigmas or pistils. Others barely open at all or don't release any pollen. All of these results give clues about what a particular gene or group of genes does when it is working properly. Ultimately, Dr. Reed and his colleagues would like to learn what genes guide flower development and how they interact with cues from the environment to do this. One day, farmers may be able to use this type of information to improve growing conditions for their crops, or genetic engineers may make modifications to improve crop yield or quality. Thank you for viewing Science360 Flower Power. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion of flowers and their important place in our lives.